And part of the September uh, planning commission meeting. Uh, thank you for breaking this into two meetings, make it a little easier on our time. I'm going to go right to the agenda. We do not have minutes from the last meeting. We're going to carry that over to the October meeting. And we'll start with an administrative item. We just have to clear up our uh, vice chair and chair position. So I'm going to turn to Steve, uh, who is our chairman of the nominating committee, to take the floor for a second. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. Uh, we've uh, nominated uh, Julia Hurl for vice chair and Ed DiMarconio for chair. A second. I second those. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. We'll go right into um, application SD 2011 SD04, Right Aid of Pennsylvania, Inc., to consolidate two lots in construction and construct a pharmacy with a drive through at 237 East Lancaster Avenue. Is the applicant present? Yes, sir. Thank you. Are we ready? That's great. Good evening, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Don Petros. I'm an attorney representing Rite Aid. Uh, this, as you probably know, this project's been ongoing for quite some time, a number of years. Uh, I guess this is at least our sixth appearance here. Uh, but in any event, where we are now is that we are seeking your recommendation of preliminary land development approval for the proposed Rite Aid uh, at 237, 245, uh, East Lancaster Avenue. I believe the township is assigning 237, so sometimes it just says 237 East Lancaster Avenue. Uh, with me this evening are Richard Bradley, who's the regional construction manager for Rite Aid, Rhett Chilberti of Bowler Engineering, who's the project engineer, and uh, I think Paul Master Pieri is here, also who's the owner of the property. Um, the plans that you have before you are dated March 9th, 2011, at last revised August 11th, 2011. We've received a copy of a review letter dated September 9, 2011 from Gilmore and Associates Township Engineers recommending that preliminary approval be considered at this time contingent upon the applicant addressing the outstanding comments in the review letter as well as any comments that the Planning Commission or Board of Commissioners might have. Uh, we, what we have done to try to uh, facilitate this a little bit is we've prepared a written response to the review, the outstanding review comments and we have uh, we, we type the comment and then the response to each of those. So with the commission's uh, permission, I'll hand up copies of those to the uh, members of the Planning Commission. I've handed copies, uh, left copies for Sue and also for uh, Township Engineer and the solicitor. Okay. Let's see. Is it okay if I just hand them down here and pass them down? <clears throat> Before we dig into the detail, can you take just a few minutes and kind of give us an overview of the major differences from this plan than the last sure. one that we saw? Uh, sure, and, uh, and I can do that. Rhett, do you want to, you want to do that? I'll let our engineer, Rhett Chilberti, do that. Before, uh, before I get into the, the differences, just to give you a, a quick overview of the plan, just because I know it's been a, a bit of time since we last uh, were here. The right aid is about uh, 14,600 square feet. Parking field is located to the east. Uh, the loading area is located to the west of the building. Um, green areas, of course, are all the landscaping proposed. And we're providing uh, access along Lancaster Avenue and along Aberdeen Avenue. Drive through is located on the north side of the building. The, the difference is, uh, big picture differences from the previous plan include we, we used to have a, um, a basically was a uh, what we call tote storage enclosure. Mas it was a, a wall masonry wall type that would store the totes uh, when we bring the product from the from the truck into the store. So that has been removed from the plan. We also had the trash enclosure located on the northeast side of the building that has been removed um, and relocated to the north side of the building. Um, that, that will continue to be an enclosure, it'll, it'll have a wall, it'll have um, a fence along the front of it as well. We added a landscape island along this row of parking to break up the parking um, along Lancaster Avenue and uh, we also added a tree in that location. We, we used to have uh, a larger curb cut here with a large radius along Lancaster Avenue and along Aberdeen Avenue. Those have been reduced to meet the township's uh, standards and they're now down to 25 feet wide. 
Um, that's basically the, 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 the high points. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if you have the uh, Bowler engineer response, as, as I said, it gives the, the township engineer's comment and then the uh, response to that. And um, the first comment relates to the seven parking spaces that, that are up where I'm pointing to in this area here. Those spaces, as you will recall, are located partially on township property and partially on the uh, applicant's property or the owner's property. And there's, there's been an, there's an existing uh, easement agreement for parking uh, that provides that those spaces are for the township's use at least, I think, from the morning till 4.30 in the afternoon. And um, so the, those, uh, the, the comment was that we've relocated the, uh, the, the dumpster to uh, that area, and the, the engineer's comment is that we need to talk to the township solicitor about, you know, whether an easement is necessary for that location. The, the way that it that came to be was that uh, when that comment was raised, I think at the April 1st uh, planning commission meeting, uh, subsequent to that, I met with uh, Dan Malloy, then township engineer, and we talked about this issue and how to resolve it, and I asked Dan, uh, if we were able to locate it back there to provide, put it behind the building, and, and it would take up two of those uh, parking spaces if we could give him, give the township two other parking spaces to be used for township's purposes. Uh, Dan uh, indicated that that was fine. In fact, he even directed us as to the two uh, parking spaces that would be designated for township use as well as these spaces here. Now, obviously, we, we will uh, talk to the solicitor about that, and that, that will ultimately be up to the uh, Board of Commissioners uh, uh, about that. But it does enable us to get the, the trash enclosure area behind the building. The, um, so our answer is that we will discuss that with the township solicitor. And comment number two, that has to do with the uh, delivery truck uh, turning and the uh, engineer has asked that we provide the CAD files for the truck turning plans to verify the proposed truck turning will be possible. And the response is that uh, the applicant will revise the plans to clarify the truck turning movements. The truck turning movements will also be revised to avoid a conflict with the drive through canopy and a CAD file shall be provided to Gilmore and Associates Inc. So uh, our engineer is telling us that it does work, but we'll provide the CAD files to Gilmore so that they can verify and satisfy themselves that it works as well. Comment number three uh, had to do with the delivery time of materials, and I think we had indicated a response letter that the tractor trailer deliveries would be between uh, 2 a.m. and 7 a.m. in the morning to avoid conflict with the township's public works trucks that would be accessing the uh, township facility. And the comment was that we should coordinate that with the director of public works, and our response is that we will. We'll, we'll go. We have some flexibility. We'll meet with the director of public works and come to an agreeable time for those deliveries to avoid, uh, avoid conflict. Uh, the next comment that had an outstanding comment was number seven which had to do with the foot candle values uh, and the township engineer notes that the foot candle values on the property at 106 North Aberdeen, which is the uh, Wisniewski, Ruth Wisniewski property where I'm pointing to here, uh, had to be brought down to 0.1 foot candles. They were not on the previous plan. Uh, he, he notes that they are now at 0.1 foot candles, but he's raising a question. There are similar fixtures near the township public works facility. He's saying, well, why are those uh, uh, readings of foot candles higher, and the the answer is that it, it was modeled on the 106 North Aberdeen property with a six foot high fence along that property, and so the readings are correct. Uh, Ruth Wisniewski has uh, sp uh, spoken publicly, I think, at two meetings, and uh, I think she came here at one meeting and said the only thing she was interested in was a was a six foot high fence. We we also met with her out of the meeting and, and asked her what she wanted, and, and that's all that she was interested in was a six foot high fence, which we've uh, shown on the plans. So it does meet the township ordinance. Is the uh, is the simple answer? Um, I think we were up. To, that was number seven. I think the next one that had an outstanding comment was number. Uh, 
10 that says the plans must be revised to comply with the Shade Tree Commission's August 24, 2011 recommendations. And our response is the applicant shall comply with the Shade Tree Commission's August 24, 2011 recommendations. And then we set forth what those recommendations were. The next comment that was outstanding was number 12. And uh, we now have the, the required concrete sidewalks that run through the driveways that are required by the WBOD ordinance. But uh, the comment, the engineer's comment is that the reinforcement it's, is not shown and the detail must be revised to show that reinforcement. The response is the reinforcement shall be provided within the concrete sidewalk detail. So we will add that to the plan. Uh, the next outstanding comment was on number 15, where he, the engineer notes that we've revised the curb radius to 25 feet. This is the, uh, the radius at Cromer and Lancaster Avenue, and that was a request I think that Dan Malloy had made uh, previously. And he, he just says that if the, if the truck turning uh, doesn't work out, we may need to increase that uh, radius. And our response is we, we believe it does work out. We'll provide the information. If it doesn't, we will increase the radius. So basically, the answer to that is that it's a will comply. Number 16 was the, um, um, the the comment is that the applicant's engineer has indicated in his response letter that the existing soils exhibit characteristics of potential contamination. The final plan shall provide notes indicating how contaminated soil will be handled if encountered during construction. And by the way, we're here on preliminary plan approval, but uh, that's a final plan comment. And our response is that we'll comply. The plan will be revised indicating how contaminated soil will be handled if encountered during construction. There's a whole protocol that you have to go through. And we'll, I think his comment is he just wants us to put that on the plan. And then the next uh, outstanding comment was number 19, uh, which had to do that the, uh, the request by the township that we um, put new overhead uh, signal heads in, in the traffic signals at Lancaster Avenue and Aberdeen, and also upgrade the signs to high intensity sheeting. And our, uh, the engineer notes that we said we're going to do that. He's suggesting that a note be added to the plan and that that be a condition of final approval. And our response is that the plans will be revised to provide the note that this requested. The next uh, comment was number 20 on the WBOD streetlights, and the engineer's comment is, it appears that the lighting plan was revised to provide the correct number of WBOD streetlights. However, the streetlights have not been labeled, and a detail has not been provided. This information must be provided on the lighting plan, and our response is the lighting plan should be revised to identify the public streetlights and the associated detail. And then in number 21, just sort of general site amenities, uh, the, the bold part, has to do with the request that we had received from the staff. And it was primarily uh, Dan Malloy, Matt Bauman, and at the time, Bob Loper, that we do a Welcome to Wayne Business District sign uh, somewhere in the corner there. And we have always indicated that we were you know, willing to do that. We just need a little direction from the township. And I think that the, uh, the comment is just saying we need to work with the township on that. We, we just need somebody to show us what they want. We're willing to. Uh, to, to provide a sign there. Now, we, we may have to work that out with, with our signage and what the ordinance allows and, you know, all of that, but we're, we're certainly willing to do that. The other comments are under stormwater management ordinance review, Roman numeral three. Uh, those are all uh, minor comments. In fact, I think Dan Malloy's comment had been that it appears to comply with the ordinance, but these are mostly notes and things, agreements that are necessary under the ordinance. And I won't go through each one, but our response to every one of those is we'll comply. And then in Roman numeral four general comments, um, a detail shall be provided for the proposed removable bollards. And our response is a detail of the proposed removable bollards shall be provided on the plans. Number two is that the township signature blocks on sheet two should be deleted, presumably because this is a preliminary plan, and we'll delete those signature blocks. Number three, the plan indicates that three-inch roof drain pipes are proposed. <clears throat> Typically, roof drain pipes are no smaller than four inches in diameter. The applicant's engineer should verify the proposed pipes provide sufficient capacity. And our response is uh, capacity calculations for the proposed three-inch rain uh, roof drain pipes shall be provided. We, we believe they're adequate. If the township engineer agrees, then we'll leave them as they are. If he doesn't, we'll make them compliant with uh, his request. 
Number four was the proposed handicap ramps located adjacent to the handicap parking spaces are shown as being designed at, at the maximum permitted slopes allowed by ADA. We recommend that the ramps be redesigned to lessen the slopes to ensure that an adequate safety factor is provided to allow the ramps to fully comply with ADA. And our response is the proposed ADA ramp along the east side of the building should be widened to decrease the ramp slope. And so those are our, our responses to the, uh, the, the outstanding township engineer comments. Questions for the applicant? I have a question. Okay. Uh, now, you can control when your big trucks come in for deliveries. How yes. about UPS and FedEx and those type of deliveries? The, you know, those trucks we don't have uh, control over. Right. Um, the, we can control when the tractor trailers come in. The other trucks sh really shouldn't have a problem uh, ne negotiating, you know, within the uh, the loading space that's provided. They'll uh, come from the back, or will they park the, out in the parking lot and run in through the front door? The, well, what they're supposed to do is that they're supposed to come into the loading area that would be along uh, Aberdeen and uh, unload, and then you know they can they can uh, turn around and go back out. Uh, no, I'm sorry, not Aberdeen. They come in Cromer, right. and then turn around and come back out Cromer. Honestly, you know, uh, it, wouldn't park in the parking lot mostly. it wouldn't shock yeah. me if the smaller yeah. trucks will just park in the parking lot, unload, and, and leave. Uh, you know, as you know, we have a Rite Aid functioning in uh, Wayne right now up near the movie theater, and, um, you know, it, it, it works. I mean, it's, um, the deliveries work fine. There's, well, the only concern is you don't have a drive through in that one, I believe, do you? No. There's, there's so no that you have somewhat of a conflict if trucks during the day come in. And somebody's using the drive-through, don't you? Uh, well, well, no. I mean, the trucks can turn around; should be able to turn around without really even going into the uh, into the drive-through. It's the tractor trailers that will need to back up uh, to go into the drive-through. Okay. Smaller trucks will be able to will be able to turn. They can zip through. Yeah. Okay. And what page is your chart showing parking relative to space and so forth? The the number of parking spaces. Yes. It should be right on the site plan. Site note five. Yeah, number five. Two, Which page two? Page two, number five. Okay. What is required for zoning on um, this? 40, 40 parking spaces. And you have that? We have 40. We, we didn't count, even though we're allowed to park in the seven after, we didn't count those in, in our 40 okay. calculations. So you need no further uh, zoning variances or anything like that? I certainly hope, hope not. Don't, don't you need a, a waiver because of one of the uh, landscape um, partitions? Yeah, yes. To well, hit the number or the, without? The, the, the issue there is that the, the general requirement under the township's ordinances is, is that you can have 10 parking spaces before you have it broken up with a landscape island. But in the WBOD, for some reason, the requirement is five spaces before you break it up with a landscape island, which, in my opinion, is, is almost counterintuitive. Yet parking in the real downtown area is at a premium. and. That's a very unusual requirement to require a landscape aisle after every five five spaces. We did our best to try to come as close to that as possible. And in most instances, that's why we put this landscape island here and broke up. We had nine in a row there, I think, uh, and we broke it up so we have five and four. But we have a number of places where we have seven. And um, we have one place right along here, right along the building, where we still have, I believe, nine spaces there. Now, we, we can't put a landscape island in there, but we do have our handicapped space in, and this area here is striped, so there won't be any vehicles parked there. So I don't think there'll be anywhere on the plan where there'll be more than seven vehicles uh, in a row. So you're, you are correct, uh, Mr. Kunda, we do need a, we have requested a uh, waiver for that. Ed, I have a, I have a question. Uh, this question is actually for the engineer. David. Did you, from what I see in this letter from Gilmore, it appears that it's, it, it appears, and this may not be the case, that it's mostly kind of a review of Dan's comments? That, that's correct. I mean, since Dan did a full review of this previously, we took his comments 
um, and just move forward with them. I mean, that's not to say we put the blinders on and didn't look at other issues, but generally, Dan's comments, we felt, you know, covered the plan and its review. So, so I don't have my WBOD book in front of me to know if there's some change, some differences, but I, I mean, I saw some other variances, I mean, uh, waivers under 255 that they would need because it, 255.29 A1 would call for 20 foot length parking spots and they've only got 18 foot. They call for nine and a half by 20 and these are all nine by 18. What was, I'm sorry, what was the section again? 255.29 A1. And that may be different in WBOD, I'm not sure. And then I don't see the dimensions of um, the off street loading. I, I can read that it's 17.4, but I don't see how long it is. <coughs> so I can't tell if it, if 255-30A, if they're in compliance with that as well. Okay, yeah, I, I have my zoning, I'll take a look at it. Um, uh, sub, yeah, two, oh, yeah, subdivision. Uh, subdivision, okay. Okay, so that answers my question. So you haven't done like a whole no to because see if other again might have popped up. Yeah, I mean, okay. I know Dan re had reviewed this okay. a few times, but yeah. Um, and then the issue of the tra trash receptacles on township property. Yes. Will they need an easement for that as well? Because the old Dan's comments all reference the seven parking spaces and the easement for that. But now we're going to be putting trash on right, no. township property. And I know you mentioned that slightly. It's just none of none of these notes reference some of these new changes, which is what had me ask you. Did you review the the plan? Yeah, I, I mean, actually, my first comment does re reference the trash dumpsters and the fact that they're on township property. It, it does, and that's a new comment that wasn't in in, in Dan's letter because at the time we didn't have the right the trash enclosure there. Um, and then the notion of the uh, one of Dan's first comments: the applicant has received the following variances yeah, yeah. or special exceptions from the zoning code. David, this is in your letters. Um, yes. A special exception under Zoning Code 280.53.9A uh, and 53.9F was granted to approve the proposed drive-through in the precise manner shown on the plans. Has anyone confirmed that this plan is exactly as it was shown at the WBOD when they got the exception for the drive for the drive-through pharmacy? I haven't compared it to the zone. I, I don't have the zoning hearing board exhibit, but I compared it against the previously submitted preliminary land development plan, and they matched up. So it, it, okay. it, it is the same. The, the, the drive through is exactly the same. Okay, I, I took that to mean the whole the plan as a whole, not just the drive through. Well, um, I don't think the zoning hearing board uh, took it that way. But I, I'll give you one example. They they asked us if we would uh, put in. An architectural offset here where we have the overhead doors and you know we agreed to do that in response to we, we agreed to do that in response to their specific request uh, to do that and, and I raised this issue because you raised the issue previously and you know w was advised that that's not what they were talking about you know they're, they're talking about you know they, they realized that going through the land development plan if somebody says put another tree here there, there's going to be a change there's no way you're going to get through land development without minor changes to the plan but it, it, it really is essentially the same plan the changes we made have been ones that have been requested here for example the you know the width of the the curb cuts and that that sort of thing and so I guess my final question is the the waivers that you need with regard to the parking if the building were smaller, you'd be able to meet all the requirements for the parking without waivers. I mean, this is a, you've run out of space. That's the reason you need some of these longer stretches without islands. What, what is the reason for the waiver, I guess, is my question. Why not just meet the code? The, uh, the reason for the uh, waiver is that we're trying to take into account you know, all the other comments have been made, you know, move the dumpster here, don't, don't put it here, uh, put, put an island in here, and it's, it's just not possible to uh, get, the, you know, the required parking uh, on the plan. Um, if we didn't have a, a building at all, we could, we could put more parking in, and we could comply uh, with the ordinance, but um, that, that's a, I think that the reason that that provision is in the subdivision of land development ordinance instead of being in the zoning ordinance is because 
even the people that, that drafted it recognize that that's an extremely difficult. I, I've been doing this for 35 years. I've, I've never seen any place else where you need to have every five spaces have a landscape island. It's just, it's unheard of. So if the building were smaller, you'd be able to meet the code, you wouldn't need the waiver? Because you'd, you'd have more room to maneuver and wiggle I, and do, I, the, do I, this. Yeah, you know, I don't know. We'd have to. We'd have to look at that. We there are a lot of constraints. Put, we have to put the building at the build to line. There are a number of things that we that we have to do. It, it is. I can't. It is certainly possible. Okay. Thank you. Just remind me. We talked about this a long time ago. Hours of operation with the drive-through. Does it increase from where the store is running now on the other side of Wayne, or how? What's the proposed hours of operation? No, I'm, I'm going to, I may have to check this with uh, Rich, but my understanding is that this is not proposed to be a 24-hour store. And I think the closing time was probably uh, 10, 10 to possibly 11, but we'll say 10 for uh, this evening's purposes. And the pharmacy closes at the same time that the, uh, the store closes. Correct? I have one more question. The uh, square footage on the building, is that the same as the plan that we yeah. saw before? It's exactly the same. Even with the offsets and the adjustments for loading and everything else? Yes. Okay. Is that correct, Rick? Yes. Any other questions? Uh, public comment? Oh, go ahead. I did have one last question. It was a discrepancy in the comments again. David, this question's for you. Um, as the plan reads on the agenda tonight, let me get the wording correctly here, uh, to consolidate two lots and construct a pharmacy with a drive through Comment number nine on page four of your letter, David, which again is referencing Dan's comments, says the plan and title report indicates there are five lots that are involved in this. Is it five lots or two lots? It, it, you want me to? Well, I mean, it, it, we were a little thrown to at first. Um, I guess it initially was five lots, right. but then it was reduced to two lots, and so now it's a combination of two lots. I, I think that's correct. I think what happened, it, it, I believe if you look at the Delaware County Public Access, the tax records, I think it shows just two folio numbers and two map numbers now. But um, on, when we had an Alta survey done of the property, they showed the original lot lines for the original parcels that were part of it. And just to avoid any, any confusion, we just show those lines and put Zs through them to make it clear that this was intended to be just one, one parcel. Do you, do you have the, are the deeds part of the record so that we can? We, we have submitted the deeds with each of the uh, zoning applications. So it is two lots because they were previously consolidated or because they were never five? It's my understanding, if you look at the Alta survey, which we've also provided to the township, uh, it indicates that they were previously consolidated. I didn't pull any records to check to see if they were, because we're agreeing that they're all being consolidated now. But that's what the, the Alta survey indicates. Sure. Any other questions? Public comment. Anybody, any public comment? Gone once, twice, thank you. Any further discussion? Do I have a motion? I'd like to make a motion that we approve the plan with the uh, adjustments and corrections made as indicated. I have a motion. Any final comment? Not a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Opposed. One opposed, motion carries. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Item number two, zoning hearing board discussion, appeal number 2861, CF Holloway the third and company, 40 Luella Court. Applicant proposed to reduce the number of units and to provide the required parking spaces for the reduced number of units by constructing an underground garage with 24 parking spaces. The garage will be an accessory to the existing non-conforming multifamily residential use, but shall be in conformity with all zoning requirements. The applicant is here. Good evening. We're gonna shuffle some papers and be right with you.
and the floor is yours. Go right ahead. Good evening. My name is David Falcone with Saul Ewing. I'm here on behalf of the applicant, C.F. Holloway III and Company. Um, we were before you all, I think it was last month, um, discussing the proposed construction of the underground garage out at the Forty Luella site next to the mansion. Just a brief overview to get at kind of everybody back up to speed where it was. The existing mansion is used for 25 um, apartment units. Mr. Holloway is, is proposing to create uh, 12 condominium units and along with that condominium to construct an underground garage next to the mansion. Uh, what is where the mansion is right now is an existing above ground two car garage as well as some paving and other parking spaces, um, some green area as well, and that's designated on the plan prepared and by Chester Valley engineers and, and submitted to the commission, but in, in that area that I just designated. We had submitted the plans and received a review letter from Mr. Lay. Um, that review letter I saw is noted in your agenda handout, but is dated September 9th, 2011. We had issued a response to a previous review letter. Um, our engineer, Angelo Capuzzi, drafted a response um, and submitted that, but the more current review from Mr. Lay is more streamlined, and I guess that's what we'll be dealing with this evening. This evening with me I have Angelo Capuzzi from Chester Valley Engineer, uh, Tim Wentz from Gate 17 Architecture, and, and Cass Holloway as well. So we are looking for um, feedback and a recommendation to go forward to the zoning hearing board with respect to a zoning application we have in front of that board. We are not here in the land development phase of our application just yet. What is the uh, zoning request that you're making? We have uh, two zoning requests in front of the board. One is a challenge to the decision that Mr. Bauman made as zoning officer deeming that we need to go in front of the board uh, to, re to request an expansion of a non-conforming use. Mm -hmm. um, in the alternative, we've, we've requested that if that is deemed to be appropriate, that we receive that um, special exception application to expand the non-conforming use and a variance from the degree of that expansion. Okay, thank you. Are you finished? I am finished. Cass wanted me to point out, sure. we do have landscaping plans as well. I know that was an issue the last time we were here, but I didn't know whether we wanted to get through the comments first and then get to the landscaping, but we do have landscaping plans prepared as well, and uh, we've got them, and we're prepared to discuss those as well. Why don't you go ahead with your comments, or comments to the comments. The, Angela, do you want to walk through the comments? Do to, I'll have Angela walk through sure. since he issued the response letter. Good evening. Um, going through Dave's review letter, on page two, um, he, he talks about the fact that we've added curb and sidewalk around the perimeter property. We haven't added sidewalk in the northwest corner in order to protect the root systems of the large trees in that, that area, in that area, which was a request of your shade tree commission. But there are locations, especially on the southern side of the property, where the proposed sidewalk extends beyond the existing right-of-way line, in which case we would have to provide some additional right-of-way or easement area in order to cover that, that public sidewalk area, and we're willing to do that. And we'll indicate those additional rights-of-way or easements on our land development plan. Can I ask you about that before you go on? Go um, the large trees in the northwest corner, Yes. I understand we don't want to disturb them in any way. Um, have you provided for uh, continuing the sidewalks through that area in the event that those trees die in the future? Uh, we have not shown that on the plan. If that's a, uh, uh, w what we have done is we've maintained the existing pathway that, that runs through that area closer to the building. Our, our thought was that uh, folks walking in that area, if they wanted to walk on a, an a, on approved path, they could possibly use that existing walkway.
comment number two refers to the size of parking spaces. We've uh, modified the garage plan to indicate parking spaces at nine and a half by 20 feet. And um, there is a comment about the size of some parallel spaces that we've added to the north side of Lowell Court. Um, those parking spaces are in fact 22 feet long and we'll dimension them, dimension them as such on the land development plans, but they are 22 feet in length. Um, this comment deals with um, storm water. And um, as I mentioned in my response letter to the previous review letter, we will design a stormwater management system that, that accounts not only for any increased impervious and additional runoff on the property. We'll have stormwater management systems to contain both the uh, post-development rates and also uh, provide recharge in accordance with township regulations. Um, the, the, uh, the premise here is that the, the, the uh, garage will have a concrete roof and we're designing the roof such that it drains from north to south. There is a drainage system in, uh, which sits on top of the garage uh, roof surface that will collect any water that infiltrates through the soil and will collect that in, in, a, in a perimeter collection pipe and, and discharge that into a detention system on the south side of the, of the garage building. But bottom line is <coughs> our final design will be in full compliance with Township Code. Is that roof Impervious or impervious? The, the roof is concrete. So, so it would be impervious. impervious. Right. But what does a, that do to your percentage of impervious coverage? Well, the, the ground surface above it is not impervious. It's well, that's impervious. my question. Right. Um, it's a building, to, though. We're going to, uh, based upon your, your code, the, the, the roof is not counted as impervious because the surface above it is green. So. We'll have to calculate the amount of water that will percolate through the soil and, and run across the surface of the roof and control that as though it, part of it is impervious, part of it may not be okay. considered impervious. Did I understand you correctly? You said according to our code, because there's grass on top of the roof, it's not counted as pervious, the, impervious? The surface of the ground is, is porous. And it's not The ground on the roof you're talking yes. about. Because... As I recall, the first time we had a green roof before the zoning board, we didn't know whether that would be counted as pervious or impervious. And I was wondering if something was added to Radnor Code now that states that a green roof is pervious or impervious? Not that I know of. Uh, not that I'm aware of either. Can you point out what part of the code you're referring to? The uh, uh, definition for impervious surfaces, I'll step in since I have it open, okay. uh, defines an impervious surface as surfaces that do not absorb rainwater. Uh, then goes on and lists various surfaces that meet that definition. Um, it really, unfortunately, the way it's written, does not anticipate the situation where you have a man-made impervious surface that is then covered with a surface that does absorb rainwater. Um, so you know, tie goes to the developer in these cases. And since the surface does absorb rainwater, but due to its depth, uh, probably won't absorb all rainwater, depending on the size of the storm, um, they, it doesn't count, it doesn't meet the definition of impervious surface and therefore is not counted as impervious surface uh, in the calculations for the site. So you're not using that as any, in any way impervious in your calculations? Well, I, I guess what we have to do is, and, and it probably requires some discussion with the township engineer. I think it requires a lot. <laughs> uh, normal impervious surface has a, a runoff coefficient of 0 0.95. 95 percent of the water that hits an impervious surface runs off. Whereas a lawn area, the amount of runoff might only be 25 to 30 percent. So we're probably t looking at a runoff coefficient that's somewhere between 95% and 30%. And that's a big dis difference. It, it is. Where do you why. think you would be? I, I Personally, I think we're probably about midway between the two. Okay. How much dirt do you plan on having on top of that? 12 inches. 12 inches. Right. You know, when you were before us before, it was 18 inches. We talked about having 18 inches in the center because we were crowning the, the surface so that the water would sheet in two directions. In order to, we modify that design, we have the roof pitching from the north side to the south side, which allows us to maintain a uniform 12-inch thickness 
on, on the roof structure itself. Just for a point of reference, um, normal green roofs only carry anywhere from three to five to six inches of soil on top of that green roof system, and they have a sub-drainage system similar to what we're proposing for this project. So we're trying to uh, design something that, that mimics a green roof but does provide additional soil on top, and the more soil you provide, the more capacity you have to hold water. Is there any structural issue with the uh, concrete? I mean, could you do 18 inches everywhere instead of 12? If we do 18 inches, that's going to exaggerate the, the uh, issue in the southeast corner of the property where we, we have our maximum height of the garage in relationship to the street. We try to keep that area as low as possible to um, minimize the, the sight lines looking across that corner. Um, 18 inches, I don't think it's going to do anything from a stormwater management standpoint. It would increase the cost of the roof structure because there would be more load to, for the roof to carry. If, if that garage were considered impervious, what percentage is that adding to your total? I haven't done that calculation. I can't answer Ballpark, because it looks as large as the building. It, Actually, it's larger than the building. That's a good so estimate. So it would probably yeah. double it. Probably. How much are you increasing your uh, water retention to handle that? We haven't designed the system okay. yet. Right, right now, as it stands, I think we're actually reducing the amount of impervious coverage on the property because we're demolishing the existing surface parking lot and the existing garage. So um, from an impervious coverage standpoint, this project would reduce the amount of impervious coverage, and that would equate to a reduction in flow. If, if we have to consider the garage surface as uh, impervious, then we would have to add additional stormwater management. We have to do mm -hmm. stormwater management regardless. It would just increase the size yeah. of this system. I, I realize that, and excuse me if I'm harping on this, but there's a lot of water problems in Wayne. And this is not something that we do have law on. And I, I don't know that uh, we necessarily know what that number would be, but I think we should err on the side of um, being conservative, and therefore increase a lot what your water retention would be and not consider this as a reduction in impervious. Because a foot of soil with the rains we've had lately isn't going to hold a whole lot. And it's not a sponge. And, uh, you know, I, I just am very concerned with the amount of water that is going to run downhill in, all, in an already overloaded area with water and aging sewers and everything else. I, I'm really concerned with the amount of uh, pervious or impervious or whatever we want to call it because we don't have good law in this area. So I'm asking you at this point to really look at what you're doing with this water retention and increase it by 50%. Because I think just ballparking it, you're doubling, if that were considered a regular building with an impervious top, uh, you are doubling your impervious. So, and I do not buy the fact that you're reducing your impervious because you're eliminating the gravel that's there and a little bit of driveway and the building that's there. I'm concerned with the amount of runoff. This is, this is kind of a guessing game. I mean, you think it's going to work. There was a concern that the engineer had a concern when the uh, comment number three for 255-31C of particular concern is the 18 inches of soil proposed above the parking garage and the potential for poor infiltration due to its shallow depth. And we're going to, they're going to cut that by a third. I, I, well, I guess the other question, though, you did say that you were going to infiltrate the the water that goes through. So where is that going and how is that being dealt with? What, what we're planning to do is, um, is to take the runoff from the existing roof of the existing building, collect that. Right now it, it flows uncontrolled. It just discharges onto grade. We're proposing to collect the entire roof area of the existing building and divert that into two stormwater management systems in the front of the existing building. And we're, we're looking uh, to- Underground systems? Underground systems. Yeah. That would be full recharge systems, okay? So our, our intent is not to overlook the fact that we're building a garage, but to try to manage the water as best we can. 
and it might be a little more practical to, to manage existing impervious than to try to collect all the runoff from an area that might be considered grass or might be considered impervious. We will have systems for both, but our recharge system will be uh, based upon collecting the water from the existing building. Can you, have you, or can you do a calculation to let us know, uh, is it a net positive or net negative? Well, the, the ordinance is written such it has to be a net positive. The, the ordinance, the way the ordinance is written, you have to, and depending yeah. upon the drainage shed which is, which, within which this property is located, there are automatic reductions in flow that have to occur uh, for a new development. I guess the question is, um, you know, everybody's concerned about water flow here. How much square footage is the is the existing building? What's what's the footprint that you're you know that you're going to divert or you're going to start? It's roughly 7,600 square feet. And what is the square footage of the parking garage? I I, I didn't calculate that, but it's roughly about the same. Okay, so it seems to me if you're if the parking garage is going to absorb some of the water, but not all of it, and you're going to take the same size structure which is being flowing over now, and you're going to keep that all in sight, it would seem to me then that, I don't know, you might have an, I guess we'd like to understand if you, is there any calculation, because you know that with 12 inches, not all of it is going to run out. Is there a calculation that can be done to determine how much of that will be absorbed and how much runs out? Nor normally speaking, 12 inches of soil can hold about two and a half inches of, a, of a water runoff before it becomes saturated. Okay. okay. Um, and, and maybe I didn't make myself clear, but the drainage system we have on the roof of the struct garage structure will convey any water that, that doesn't get absorbed. Um, it would collect that water and discharge it into a collection system, a pipe collection system that we have around the perimeter of the garage. And that system would be over-designed such that it would fill up and slowly discharge over a longer period of time, similar to like a, a bathtub effect. So we're doing detention for the runoff from the, from the garage roof and recharge from the runoff from the existing uh, mansion building. And by combination of those two two systems, we would meet the requirements of the township code. So we're not, we're not just letting the water from the garage roof just run off uncontrolled. Okay, so you've done a calculation as to what the net runoff of the roof would be in light of the fact that you have 12 inches of soil there. So theoretically, you're capturing, you're, you're addressing Kathy's concern in that you've calculated what that runoff will be. Right. The, the question becomes what the exact number is that we should use. It's, I think it's somewhere between 30% and 95%. Maybe it's higher than, closer to 95%. That's the decision. Okay, so that's, the, so you haven't really sized those we cisterns yet the system because yet. you haven't agreed on what you're going to use as the. Well, normally that, that calculation is done during the land development stage. Okay. But okay. you would meet code assuming that that surface is considered well, pervious. Uh, from what I hear tonight, yes, we would meet code. <laughs> so are you, are you confident that whatever runoff coefficient is decided on between yourselves and the township engineer, you're going to have the room and the capacity to then build the stormwater management system to meet that? Yes. But, and let me say one more thing about green roofs. I mean, in, in obtaining approvals for, for projects larger than this, um, there's a permit that has to be obtained from the uh, local uh, Delaware County Conservation District and also DEP. It's called an NPDES permit. And categorically, if you have a project that has a green roof, DEP will say that that green roof satisfies whatever water or uh, stormwater management criteria they apply to a, to reviewing that permit. So they look at the green roof uh, technology as something that that meets their stormwater management requirements. Townships might be a little different, in which case we'll have to comply with your requirements. In those scenarios, though, the green roofs, the buildings themselves are counted as impervious buildings on the property, right? The, they're, they're not considered impervious because they're considered meadow. It's basically what they're considered. They're, you're looking at two different things. You're looking at impervious coverage from a building coverage standpoint, and you're looking from impervious coverage from a stormwater standpoint. 
DEP doesn't regulate building coverages, impervious coverages. They look at storm water. And from their perspective, a green roof acts as though the, the property is, that part of the building was a meadow, which is the goal of storm water is to convert everything back to meadow. Is it the uh, intent of um, you know, the applicant to maintain it as if it were a green roof? Because it's sort of hybrid. You said that most green roofs are six inches or less. So you're going to have an irrigation system? Because I, I would think that the grass, as long as it's vibrant and green and has a good root system, will be better at retaining water than 12 inches of possibly dead soil. Well, that, that, that area will be landscaped, and, and the plants will be chosen such that they would absorb that water that falls in that area. But it's sort of a potted plant. You know, after a week of 90-degree days, if you're not irrigating, you're going to lose that. That's true, but the, the soil retains a certain amount of moisture, as does the draining system underneath. I mean, I, I have a sample here if you want to see it, but it, 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 it really holds back the water to the point where the amount of time it takes uh, for that water to drain off that roof might be an hour longer than it would be if there was grass there. Well, green roofs generally are not just grass. Aren't they other types of plants and a certain type of material? They aren't necessarily dirt. They're a type of material that would hold water more? Yes, and our landscaping plan would, would show those types of plants. And that material, the, pl the soil material, will be specialized as well? It would be an amended soil, that's correct. When I go back to zoning because it's the first time I ran into a green roof. It was in a residential situation. It was either one or two cars. I'd be willing to take a chance on something like that to try out something new. I don't know that I'm necessarily willing to take a chance on something that's this large and has such a possibility of impacting a neighborhood that's already very tight and compact with houses and businesses and so forth. And it's on top of the hill, so the water only has one way to go, and it's down. I really think this, I would like to see, and, and I know we're early on this, but I want to get my, my thoughts in now so that maybe you can do something about it. Uh, I think the water system needs to be over-designed and not count it completely as pervious on there, because I don't think it is. And it would be great if it works. I think it's a great way to go. And I say it's wonderful for you to try something like this. But I'd like to see some track records on similar roofs and what they actually absorb in situations. Because with the rains we've had in August, we had about 30 inches. And some of them, you know, 10 inches in a week's period, where is the rest of that water going to go? A question, though. I mean, are we talking about two different things? Are you concerned <clears throat> about impervious from a building code standpoint and not exceeding that limit so you can have this development? So you're concerned about impervious and having the roof not count as impervious to meet the water calculations? As I said, the, the, the effects of impervious, they're, they're twofold. You have the stormwater component right. and the zoning component, if you want to right. call it that. Okay? We believe that, that based upon the definition in the township zoning ordinance, the, the roof area doesn't count as impervious. But from a for, storm, for, for, for zoning, for zoning. correct. Right. Okay. From storm water, that's a different issue. If, right. if, the, if the feeling is or the sense is that that area has to be considered more than grass, something that will create more runoff, whether it's fully impervious or what, we would have to account for that in our storm water management design. Okay. I, mean, I think that's what Kathy's asking for, is to make sure that that's just calculated right. in the storm water. Well, it is, but then on the other hand, if the zoning board counts this as impervious, you can't get an approval on this. But they don't. They count it as not, they count it as green. Right. So, so they're going to, the zoning's going to count it as green. And but there's so, no zoning code on it. There's no zoning law on it. Yeah. The developer wins. Right. Okay, Peter, so we just need to concern ourselves, I think, with making sure that the stormwater is, is properly designed. Well, this right. is an aside, but I want to mention it while we're on the subject, is that we need to make a note to ourselves that you know, we, we have these conversations that come up and then we move on. We need to adjust our zoning and our subdivision and land development code mm -hmm. to reflect this new technology. So let's make, well, let's put a note in the minutes so that we have it, you know, there as we move forward that that's something we're mm -hmm. going to have to address. 
Peter, is there any case law about this? Or was there a formal determination that this is in fact going to be covered, going to be counted completely as pervious with regard to the development? I, I believe the township has made that determination as far as, uh, but I could be wrong, um, but as far as I know, it, it certainly hasn't come up uh, in the township's review of this up until this point. My, read of the, my reading of the zoning ordinance language is that it just says an impervious surface is a surface that does not absorb water. You look at the surface of this garage, it's going to absorb water. Um, and the way the law is in Pennsylvania is that when something's kind of ambiguous, um, it's the landowner, the developer, the, that gets the benefit of the doubt. Um, and so, you know, this is a case, you know, as, you know, as just was mentioned, you know, the zoning ordinance doesn't anticipate this sort of situation. And it's not written in such a way to deal with the situation. It, 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 and from a practical standpoint, I agree that, yes, this does not act like pure virgin ground. But from a zoning standpoint, we can't treat it that way because our zoning ordinance language does not deal with the situation. So from a zoning standpoint, I think it does not meet the definition of impervious surface, and therefore we can't treat it that way from a zoning standpoint. And that's why they didn't ask for a variance, because uh, obviously they would need a variance if, was, if it was treated as impervious surface. That being said, stormwater is a separate ordinance, and it's, it's a separate requirements, and, sep you know, and that will have to be dealt with, and the st actual runoff will have to be uh, addressed and, and controlled. And I believe, uh, you know, right now there is no stormwater control on this site. Um, so hopefully whatever they do design will be, you know, a, a net benefit because although, you know, this might be an uh, increase of impervious, you know, you're going to start controlling that whole building at Worf of Stormwater that has not been controlled as up, up until this time. I have a... I, I just wanted to make one, one statement. Uh, going back to the question is whether or not we would comply with the impervious coverage requirements if the garage were considered impervious from a zoning perspective. Um, apparently, some of the initial plans that we developed for this property showed an above-ground garage similar in size to this. And based upon those original sketches, we were still in compliance with the impervious coverage requirements. So I don't know that there's a zoning issue with impervious regardless of, of how we count that garage. Okay. Um, are we still just addressing the, the comments? Because I do have one question. About I, don't, I don't think he's finished going. Were you finished going through the comments? We would kind of sidetrack uh, well, you there. I don't know if there's anything left. <laughs> Why don't you finish and then we'll keep asking questions. Uh, all right, the last comment had to do with uh, adding some some of the notes that we received from the Shade Tree Commission onto the land development plans. Now we'll go to any okay. additional comments or questions. Yeah, can you take us through both the landscape plan and the cross sections? I know everyone was concerned about how the slopes and the building were going to relate to the road and what that was going to look like. If you could walk us through that. I'll do my best with the landscaping. I didn't prepare that, but I'll do the cross sections first. We have a landscape. Yeah. As far as the cross section um, goes, last time we were here, folks asked us to show some cross sections for the site. You wanted to see what the grades would look like in relationship to the street level. So we, we cut four cross sections um, through the, around the perimeter of the site. I, I picked four locations which I thought were um, most extreme, if you will. And, and they, they are shown on sheet six of the plans that we submitted to the township. And I can go through those uh, one by one. Um, cross section A is taken about midway between the driveway entrance to the garage and the, um, the uh, pedestrian emergency exit from the garage. Can you point to that, please? On, on the plan, it's taken right at this location here. Thank you. 
And the cross-section is shown in the upper left-hand corner of that sheet. Uh, but basically, from the top of the garage structure, which we're showing a 12-inch uh, soil cover over the top of the garage, we have a 3.25 to 1 slope that comes down and intersects the uh, sidewalk at a point three feet behind the sidewalk, there is a condition in the township ordinance that says you're supposed to not grade within three feet of the right-of-way line. So we've, we've created a slope that provides a, a level area three feet wide behind the sidewalk area. And that's a 3.25 to one slope. So the coverage over the underground garage structure isn't really shown in this cross section, but what's the slope um, running north to south there? Across the garage itself? The roof of the garage. 1%. 1%. Okay. Until it hits that point, the first point there of what we're looking at. Yes. Okay. And that's, that's true in all the cases. Okay. The garage roof is sloped at 1% from north to, south, north to south and 3% from west to east. Okay. Um, how, how does this compare with the existing grade? How does this compare to the existing grade? Yeah. It's probably uh, several feet higher than the existing grade. I don't know exactly how high. I'd say two to three feet higher. We, we, um, we put a string line up at the site to represent the finished grade on the, uh, along the perimeter of the garage. Uh, Kaz put that up along the south side, the east side, and, and the north side. To, so that the residents could see the relative difference between the finished grade that we're proposing and the existing grade. And that, that string line's still up there if you want to take a look at it. Uh, cross section two is, is taken at the, um, at the southeast corner of the property. It's the, what I consider the ex extreme condition. And in that, in that location, we have a two to one slope that ends at a short uh, landscape wall, which is 27 inches high. The landscape wall uh, is a total length of 21 feet in that southeast corner, and the maximum height is 27 inches. It rises from zero inches on either end up to 27 inches in that location. And the two to one slope is the uh, maximum permitted by the, the saldo, and the wall is located three feet behind the right way line again to give us that level area behind the right-of-way line. Cross section C, which is at the bottom uh, left-hand corner of the, of the drawing, basically shows uh, a similar arrangement. The difference there is that the, by that point, and the cross section is taken almost midway where the, at the center of the garage on its east side, uh, just shows that we still have a two to one slope, but we've the that short uh, landscape wall is no longer needed because we can mat meet the grade at the back end of the sidewalk. And then section D is taken at the northeast corner of the garage, and that shows a relatively flat grade differential between the sidewalk area and the top of the garage. It's it's like a nine to one slope. And as you can continue around the the back side of the garage along the north side. That the grade between the street and the um, finished grade on top of the garage is, is pretty much level. What do you anticipate for the, um, the material for the wall? Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, it's probably be a, 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 a wall that has like a, a stone veneer to it. It may be concrete, a concrete wall with a stone veneer. These, these uh, cross sections, the top one, it's a different scale than the second one, isn't it? Because it actually is showing a six and a half foot drop, or six, six foot one and a half inches. Whereas section B, cross section B, is showing a four foot 11 inch drop. And it, it dawned on me that the, the scale, this four foot si sidewalk scale is half the size of the two sidewalks in B and C. So does that mean the scale of the first cross cut is a different scale? The, the, the scales for each cross section are, are shown beneath the cross section. Uh, the reason why we would have changed it is in order to fit it on the page. My, that's my point. But it's is, a true, it's a true no, 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 one that, to one scale. I understand that, okay. but my point is that in looking at A, B, and C, no, B, C, and D, 
you don't realize how dramatic the cross section A is because the scale is is half the scale, double the scale. Yes. So it's yeah. a pretty. It's I mean, visually, foot, it's it's a yes. six foot drop. But it's still six foot. Right. Okay. Um, Okay. If, if we draw it, if we draw it at one inch equals uh, uh, two inches, you know, it would look even more dramatic. We're not trying to hide anything. It's just a matter of getting the information on the plan. Appreciate that. Go right ahead. Questions? Uh, uh, you also ask about some landscaping. Any, any questions on the elevations before we go to the I landscaping? I did have. That was, what, that was what my question was earlier. I actually drove around the property today. Oh, you did? Okay. And saw the, the string stringed line. off lines. There's two string lines. I saw two. Okay. What confused me about it is that, and I was going to ask you the question about this, is that on the gate 17 pictures, just a moment, uh, where they show the north and the south and the east elevation, the picture continues to show that the, the grade of this Victorian garden area will come in line with that band on the building that is ab above that bottom row of just square windows, if that's making any sense. And so I drove the, the property today. When you look at the south side elevation, yes, thank you. Oh, that's not showing the mansion in your south side elevation picture. The grade for the garage is up at the height of this band here. What do we call this band, Ed? Right there. What do we call that? That's the right along the basement windows. Can you show me what plan I'm on the gate 17 architecture Stim page. Oh, I have the one that says underground garage, August 12th drawings, page two. That's it, yes. Cass, is, Cass has got out what I'm talking about. So if you look at the south side elevation picture at the bottom, and it shows that the, the green space on top of the garage is in line with right where Mr. Holloway's finger is, right there on the building. I read that you dropped the height of the, the um, grass roof it's come down further. Somewhere in my notes, I read that you've continued to try to drop it. You took into consideration our, our notes, and yet that on the picture still seems to be at that same height. And I drove around the property today. You know, I eyeballed it, but the, the, but the strings don't seem to be coming up as high as that, as that line. So that's what's confusing me, is that it doesn't seem it doesn't seem that the string is coming up as high as the picture is showing that the green space is actually going to be up when this is done. And I, I think that um, it's a setup for upset if people think it's going to be lower than it actually is going to be. And so I'm trying to understand which is accurate. The strings, because the strings are not in line with what's being shown on this picture as what the elevation is going to eventually be. I, I can tell you from a, from a grading perspective, the, the elevation at this point here, which is right next to the garage entrance. We're running a 3% slope down to the corner of the garage. That, well, but going well, back well, to whether or not this, this reflects that, I, I don't know. It may not, but there is no scale on this to, to indicate what, what that drop is. But there is a definite drop at 3%. It's, it's almost three foot lower at the eastern end of the garage than it is at the driveway. I understand, but this point here, it, it, this crosscut A is what I was trying to say. The first crosscut section, which is pretty close to the garage door, is showing six and a half feet up. Well, cross was this cut drawing done before you dropped the level down? No. Crosscut no? A on the other drawing that you showed us a few minutes ago. The one I was asking about the scale shows six and a half feet up from the sidewalk, which is looked to be more in line with that that band on the Luella Mansion, which is not how high up that string is when I drove the property today. That's so I'm trying to understand which is accurate: the string or the drawings, even though this particular drawing is not to scale. Or the crosscut section I, that you I showed. I think I can, I, I think I can answer that uh, 
the the road at this point the elevation is I think 96 at this point, the elevation is 94, so the six-foot relationship stays the same on the crosscut. The road is dropping, and the ground is dropping. So you have six feet here, you have six feet here, because the... It's in the road actually rising as we go around to the northwest no 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 the road if if the road you come up high here you come up to the high low. point right here starts dropping down the low points here and that's why this curb line shows it going rising pretty quick it, it rises very, very quickly, quickly as you go around the bend as you go around the bend absolutely and there's approximately five feet elevation difference from the north side of the road to the Yes. south side of the road uh so i uh, forgive my architect if he didn't get this perfectly right uh, my landscape architect worked from the actual uh, grading plan because one of the things you asked us to do was show the landscaping and she worked with the actual engineer plan so this and we also provided this in the uh, packet. It was in black and white, not in color, but this was provided. Uh, I, I, I can say that Angelo's cuts, where he's showing his cross sections uh, at the point where that cross section shows on the road and the top of the grade, stays pretty much constant because of the the road was falling to that low point very quickly from the uh, entrance but it, but at the end of the day yes the top of the grass is going to be how high against the building that's really what i'm trying to understand uh well at the bill well we're just just so you know the six foot is from the sidewalk the the from the height of the building if you go up and measure the top of the grade or the top of the door a garage door at that location we're only four feet higher than the existing grade at that location I realize, I realize does that rise. make sense I, it makes sense to me it's not an answer to my question but it makes sense to me because there is a natural rise to the property on its own yes now I saw that yes and could see that very clearly yeah. today it's still the difficult. string the string I'm sorry I, it's just me. I'm just trying to understand yes how high this mound of Victorian garden is going to come up is it is what's being shown on this picture with the south side elevation accurate it is going to come up as high as that first above that first band of windows that that basement band of windows well that that is the basement yes right. so is it going to be coming the existing up grade is right here right now and it's coming up to and the, that's approximately four feet right the string that's there makes it look like it's not coming up that high so when um when your engineer came up uh, a which moment, string are you talking about the orange strings that are that are around the site now there's a green uh we don't have a string because it fell there were there's two stakes that show right where the garage entrance is the garage door there's two stakes that are perfectly level and we had a string but that 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 dry, i drove by it today. i was at the site today and that string is no longer there, but the string is, uh, there's a stake right here, mm -hmm. and that string starts there, and then there's two strings that, that drop. One goes, one is green, and it was the original grade that we presented at the last meeting, and the new string is bright yellow, and that's the new grade. And both of those strings extend in front of the existing garage and if if uh, and that's a very good reference point the existing garage has a stone foundation and then it has uh, uh, shing not shingles but it has uh, asphalt uh, side shingles uh, and that is approximately four feet off the ground and if you look at where those both of those strings Converge because the string is very high at this end and then the second the yellow string drops much faster because at this end It's two feet lower than what we showed before but I the, those strings are 
very representative. And the, unfortunately, you can't see the string in front of the garage because there's a hedge. We had to run the string behind the hedge in front of the garage. So, thank you. I, Not sure if the applicant wants to present anything more on the elevations or go to questions. Go ahead. Uh, what I'd like to do is just, uh, as, as Angelo testified, uh, we have the sidewalk and then we have that three foot flat area uh, that's adjacent to the sidewalk. So by doing that, and that specifically that little landscape wall that uh, Angelo talked about that's 27 inches high and 21 feet long. We now have a sycamore tree. We've been able to run the sycamores entirely along that sidewalk uh, to really give it a nice, uh, what I would call a formal feel with the sycamores. Uh, the original plan that we presented at the last meeting had four Coosa dogwoods in that location because there was a concern by the shade tree because of the slope, the steepness of the slope, that they, we wouldn't be able to plant three to four inch caliber sycamore trees in that. So we were able by the new plan uh, to provide all sycamores right along the, uh, as street trees. Uh, one thing that wasn't, that Angelo didn't mention tonight, I think it's very important. Uh, when we were addressing the issue uh, from the first engineer's letter of the width of the parking spaces, we had 10 foot parking spaces on our original plan. Uh, the code allows nine and a half foot spaces. Uh, we showed our spaces between our columns, between the architectural columns that is holding up the roof of the, uh, of the ceiling of the underground garage. Uh, we did not count those towards the spaces. So we, what we did was we are still showing nine and a half doubled or a total of 19 feet from column to column. And then the columns are 16 inches. So. There's a lot of space, but by reducing the width of the parking space from 10 feet to nine and a half, we were able to pull the underground garage four feet away from the lower loop. So we actually shrunk the building by four feet uh, long, longitudinally, which really helped the grades. And I, I think that was something that was missed uh, but I wanted to point that out, that uh, we spent a lot of time with the neighbors. Uh, we, uh, there was a great concern in, uh, with the neighbors as to safety, uh, being able to see cars coming around regardless of where you stood on Luella Court. And that was uh, one of the things we were very fortunate that our architect, our structural engineer, and also uh, we worked with the uh, the gentleman that uh, is uh, going to be responsible for this drainage system for the green roof. And by doing the double cross slope, we were able to even lower the, the garage uh, more to provide that safety factor. So I, I just wanted to point that out, that the building is four feet smaller than it was on, on our, at our previous meeting. Thank you. I, do you have any other questions on the landscape plan? Questions on landscape? I assume all the existing hedging around the property would all be removed? You're not yes. showing any of that? Yes. And that was something that uh, uh, the neighbors wish that hedging could be removed tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Because at some, at some spots, that hedge is six feet high. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for the applicant? Or engineer. And I'll go to public comment. Any public comment?
Hi, I'm Susan Byrne from Luella Court. How are you? <laughs> some of you I've worked with before, some of you I haven't. Um, I just wanted to set the record straight because this has been discussed in days past and I think it just puts a bad tone on everything that the neighborhood of Luella Court is anti-development. Really not anti-development. We've worked with six or seven development companies including Amtrak and SEPTA successfully and we've done, we like that, the vibrancy of that neighborhood, that's why we're there. Um, they're good development plans and they're ill-conceived development plans and, and um, that's kind of in the eye of the beholder, but we really don't have a problem with that. In fact, that's why we want to live where we do live. Um, but it, um, we realized that this, that a development was coming for the mansion and was going to be needed for the mansion a long time ago. That's why we changed our zoning and that's why we got the historical designation for the neighborhood. Um, it's, we're not anti-progress, we're really just anti-projects that we think are risky to the little delicate neighborhood that's ours. Um, that said, this project has been, has gotten off to a very bad start. I talked to Cass about it during the second and last neighborhood meeting that we had. It didn't need to get to this crazy level of 10 meetings already. And this is the second one only in which you guys have been involved. And that to me sounds like it's a very roundabout way of doing things and a waste of our time um, the Holloway's time and also the township resources at a period when they're very strained. So um, part of the things, things that came up during this is that when you, we found in the plans they were confusing. Susan, you mentioned this. Sometimes it was difficult to understand what they were saying. And we've gotten good at, re at reading plans because we've dealt with so many developments in the past. Um, it was kind of look right, no, it's really left where you should be looking. Um, and that's how we were able to uncover accurately that the southeastern corner was more than seven and a half feet in the plans. Um, somebody earlier asked about the, um, the imperviousness and Angelo's response was that they were under impervious with the uh, first above ground plan. They were under the 40% requirement, um, but it was like 36.996. So that's a little close. <laughs> um, but so it's been a little bit complicated and hopefully we'll, we'll, it is a better plan than it started out. Hopefully it will become a better plan. Um, we're very happy at this point that it is in front of you guys because we know it'll get the scrutiny that it deserves and that the mansion deserves as the founder's house. Um, also, the string line today, I was out, I was in the house and I saw um, Cass and Cam Lacey out looking at the string line and I was just going through in preparation for the meeting so I understood what I was talking about and I, I, I'll be darned if I can figure out how that string line represents. The string line represents the, the change in the slope of the roof but I don't think it actually represents and I couldn't get Cass, I, I couldn't get a, um, a clear answer on and that's not a reflection on you, Cass. It's just I couldn't get it on that, how those strings actually represent the footprint, I'm sorry, the footprint, and also the height. According to what I see, the height is more than three and a half feet from current grade. The current grade is a couple feet above the curb line. Um, and in the course of the conversation, and maybe Cass, you can explain this because I certainly couldn't understand it. Um, it's the string lines are the right elevation above ground, but they may not be the right footprint. And I couldn't get the math to work, and I'm pretty good at math. So that may be something you want to go back and take a real look at. And that's in the, draw in the drawings that are called cross-section drawings. Um, the ones that you were looking at, and Susan, you questioned about the A plan versus the B, C, and D plan. That's the, that, the math is there. Um, and so, uh, and in any event, we're happy that it's here. We hope it the plan continues to get better and we think that it um, will get the proper level of scrutiny now, so thanks. Thank you. Further public comment? Hi, Baron Gemmer, South Wayne Avenue. Um, just two quick items. The additional parking that's on the north side is the right of way being changed or where is, where is that parking being located? I'm a little confused. What, the, where they're located? They're located on the north side and 
to just trying to pick out the right away here. It looks like, I mean, they'll probably have to uh, put forth uh, some additional right away for those, those spaces as well. In order to get them yeah. out of the front yard it, set. The, the, right now, the right away is bisecting those, uh, those spaces. So, you know, as we mentioned in our other comment, they're going to have to uh, grant some right away for those spaces as well as for the sidewalk along the north, north side. Okay, thank you. The, so, part of that leads into my second comment because obviously, granting additional right of way um, will affect the uh, area net of the right of way, which you can look on the, imperi uh, the impervious surface calculations. The other thing I don't see here, because, and if I'm taking this at, at its face value, just the tract area net of right of way, they're not subtracting out the 75% of all the steep slopes that are being created, the two to ones and the 3.25 to ones and that will affect the net lot area to the tune of 75% of those. So Baron, I mean, they would be man-made steep slopes and you, it, they, they wouldn't have read, to. Read the definition under, read the definition in 255 right. and read the court order. Right, for, for slopes that currently exist, whether they're man-made or not, you cannot, you cannot, you have to count them as natural steep slopes unless you could prove differently. Uh, I'm actually not talking about whether you can disturb steep slopes or not. The, right. If you look at the definition of lot area in 255, under 255, um, 6, D, I believe it is, or D6, it says you subtract out 75% of the steep slopes. It doesn't care how they were made. No. I'll take a look at it, but I would think the intent and the spirit is that it's, it's meant to be for natural steep no, slopes. No, I think, I think actually the intent is slopes okay. regardless I'll take a look of the water. But, yeah. So both of those would, would go to affect the, the, the uh, calculations because the denominator is going to become smaller for those. Thank you. Other public comment? <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, my name is Patrick Nolan. I live on 217 West Avenue. And my son is Cass Nose and uh, lives directly on the, on the corner, on the turn, at the south end, where the line of vision for children I have two grandchildren there, so this has constituted my concern with the project. Um, basically, I just wanted to ask a couple questions. I don't have that many observations, uh, so I'll spare you everything that preceded uh, many of the trips before. Uh, but uh, I'm just curious on one hand, with respect to this green roof, is there any uh, uh, rating as to the uh, poundage that that roof will maintain under stress? I mean, what is there a weight rating for that green roof? David, I'll turn to you up for that one if you can answer. Well, I mean, it, it would be up to the applicant at, at the time of design to put forth a plan, you know, designed by a certified structural engineer to verify that the, the roof can handle the loading of, of the material above it. Okay, uh, the roof plus the water. The, the roof plus whatever loading would be on top of, of, of the roof. Okay. So they usually include pedestrians and plants and site benches, anything snow, anything that's going to be on that roof is normally included. Okay, all right. Uh, this other, I hope, isn't taken as a uh, trivial question, but... Uh, over the meetings in the past, uh, there's four committees, I think, four commissions. Uh, there has seldom, if ever, been any reference to the issue of the historical uh, character of, of the place. Uh, the architectural and uh, co uh, commission brought that into a little bit when I talked about the space adjacent to the building, that that space for a historical space should be uh, proportionately open in relationship to the building itself, that there should be a due proportion between open space and the bulk of the building. It's the only time that I heard any reference at all to the issue of uh, the historicity of the building. Uh, no other meeting has ever done that. And I was just wondering, is there anything that you possess which indicates what the historical nature of a property uh, 
should, let's say, be possessed or guarded by uh, as far as uh, what's potential to be done with it after it is sold to the individual condo owners? I mean, if it's a historical space, uh, does the township wipe its hands clean after these 12 units are sold? And that space there after can be dealt with by the future owners in any way they wish, independent of any historical consideration? Or will there be some sense of the historicity and the historical character of the place continue through the ownership of these people. For example, uh, talk has been made in the past about putting a fence around the entire perimeter of, of the open ground. Uh, would that be appropriate to, or would that be a violation of the historical character of the property? Uh, another thing that occurred to me as I was driving over tonight, uh, Independence Hall, if, if you put uh, a dozen air conditioners in the windows down there, would those dozen air conditioners violate the historical seriousness of that particular location? And by analogy, would, I doubt it would ever happen, but would air conditioners in the windows of Luella House be appropriate for what the township has always regarded as the historical character of the place. So I don't think the historical character has really been given any kind of serious consideration, especially when you are going to be releasing this property into the hands of 12 owners who by rights of their ownership may virtually do, I suppose, almost anything that they wish. And all I'm asking is, would they be boundaried by some known historical coda that exists within the township? I, I hope I explain myself. I don't. Aren't, aren't I mean, all I'm, homes in the historic districts governed by the historic districts? I'm sorry? We, we have historic districts in, within the township. Oh, yeah. And individual homeowners within those town within those districts are, are bound by our ordinances of HARB, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, that's not going to yeah. change when individual owners take possession of the okay. of the okay. condominiums in the at the building. So the historicity of the place will still be kept intact. Plus, a I would assume historical district is a historical district. Right. Yeah, I would assume also that these are going to be condos, and there'll be some sort of homeowners association. Yeah. And they always have rules about what you can do. You can't yeah, paint your pin, yeah. your windows purple, for example. I, I know. Uh, and and obviously there will be central air conditioning in this because yeah. of the rehab. So you're not going to see window air conditioners. Um, so I I think you're really protected. And the idea is that they want to maintain. I'm assuming here, it, Kaz, if I'm not correct, please correct me. I'm assuming that you want to maintain the historical character because this building has some neat lines and the place in the township is very central on it. And I, I think that's part of the charm of the building and why it's right. worth going to the effort exactly. to go through all these renovations. Uh, and also remember the design for the garage was also the design for the underground garage was driven in part by a desire to protect the histor historical landscape exactly. without putting yeah. in the surface garage. Uh, parking. We, we got to this only after some very, very extensive, you know, contentious, you know, meetings. Uh, the last thing I would want to say is uh, uh, sometimes because of the four or five groups that were involved, a clear mandate to the next group wasn't all that uh, evident, at least to me, sitting here. Uh, and some confusions uh, frequently set in. But the one thing that I'd like to mention is uh, from time to time, I was beginning to wonder whether we, we would find a successful resolution to this for both the uh, Mr. Holloway as well as the neighbors. And uh, I can only say now that uh, watching what's going on now, uh, despite all those problems, the system works. Uh, I'm very, 
very delighted uh, to hear what I've been hearing tonight, especially with the seriousness of, of your approach. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, that the southeast corner right by the uh, sewer was as high as my, no, it was above my fingers, almost a foot, a foot above my fingers. Oh my God. Now it's five feet, and it's, it's pretty much as good a compromise as can be made. And so uh, my credit goes to Mr. Holloway for not running away from it either. So thank you very much. Well, also, we're not packing Thanks. this and sending it on its way. This is going to zoning first, oh, and that. then it comes back to us several times. Yeah. So you can come visit us a lot. <laughs> Any other public comment? Please come forward. Good evening. My name is Judy Stremmel. I live on Luella Court. Um, my concern is that there's been so many changes over the four um, commissions that we have been in front of, Mr. Holloway's been in front of, the numerous times that we've been at each of these boards. Now, at what point is there a final plan and then the final plan is approved and who oversees? Like, I didn't know that there was going to be sidewalks, good or bad. I, I wasn't aware of that. Um, also, the fact that where we live on Luella Court, we have real issues, many of us, with water in our basements to begin with. Who's going to protect us from additional water going into our basements. How does that all work? Who will um, oversee all of this so that what is being said tonight and in meetings to come and what has been said previously? Because like the trees have changed, probably for the better, um, but who is going to say, okay, here are the 12 sycamores or the 20 sycamores or however sick, many sycamores there's going to be. Who is going to be there watching that there are 12 sycamores or 14 sycamores or whatever? That the amount of soil on the top of the garage is what has been presented. I mean, who does all that? And is there an ultimate final plan that the community and the boards all approve? And then is there someone that makes sure that that plan is adhered to? The answer is yes. The, this is a, a long process. You know, if it's approved tonight to go to zoning, it'll go to zoning. It can come back here as a preliminary plan or a final plan or both. So it'll come back here at least one more time possibly twice or more. Once we approve it, if it was approved, then it goes to the commissioners for approval. And it may change along the way. Once that final commissioner's plan is approved, if it's approved, then it goes to the township. The developer has then the right to build what he's presented. He'll pull permits from the township, and it's the township's responsibility to do exactly what you say, to make sure that what's on the plan is built. Okay, and someone is watching that along the way. I mean, I have like this host of issues and concerns about when they start working on the building. I know that's not in the purview of you tonight, but I have a pregnant daughter who will be bringing her newborn baby over. What about the um, issues of whatever is in that building coming into my house? Um, who? oversees that. I mean, is there asbestos? Is there lead? Is the building wrapped while all of that's going on? I know that this is not your decision tonight. I'm just looking for answers to those kinds of questions, which are my real concerns. It's more of a day-to-day -day process that the township does handle. So yes, that's, they're responsible for that along with the developer. There'll be building permits pulled There'll be rules of what he has to do as far as grading, as far as building structures, as far as time of day that he can work, all those items, and that goes through the township. So as if well it was something as that you were to see, you would call the township and they would come out and visit with the developer. As well as environmental remediation. If there's any environmental remediation, 
it's the township and the developer's responsibility to deal with it in accordance with the rules and regulations, which generally, I don't want to quote them, but generally means in capitalization, you know, negative pressures inside the building so nothing goes outside to the outside environment. There's very specific rules and regulations about what they, what they should do. And there are people within the township that are going to be watching that whole process? Yes, yes. I mean, but look, I, I mean, you know, they're not there 24-7. So if, if the developer, any developer, wants to hide it, they can hide it. But they're breaking the rule, uh, you, know, you know, that's breaking fine. But they're breaking rules and the law, and there's criminal penalties, and it's a, it's a pretty big issue. So most developers abide by the rules. And the contractors, by the way, that do the work, they also are held liable for breaking the rules. And it, it's, I'm not saying it's never done, but it's, it's not done very often. Okay, one final. And I don't know whether it's this board or township board, another township board, or the township employees. For instance, when the construction starts on the building, like what's going to happen on our circle in terms of traffic? Where are the trucks going to be? Where is the debris going to be? Um, how is that all going to be protected? Again, that's all work between the developer and the township okay. at that point in time. There are township rules and regulations about what needs to happen on a development site. Is there, are you going to get dust? Yes, you're going to get dust. There's no question about it. But as far as road blockage, as far as, uh, you know, retention to make sure that the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, drainage doesn't drain off and get mudslides down the street. I mean, they have to put up barriers for that and things like that. But they'll, the township's in charge of enforcing our rules and regulations on the developer relative to their construction activities. It sounds like an enormous job. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other public comment? Any other questions or comment from the board? Just, we don't oh, have a moment. One more, hold oh. on. That was my next. That's okay, go right ahead. Uh, my name is Susan Bowers, and I currently live in the mansion. And I, I love the mansion, and I'm really sad that it's going to be changed the way it's going to be changed, because it will no longer be available to the people of Wayne, the school children of Wayne, and it will be the inside of the building will be destroyed. It will, none of the, the things that are in there will be there anymore. And they're also, if I understand it correctly, going to take out the windows. So when we talk about having, I was really very disappointed in the architectural board. They did nothing to protect the mansion, in my opinion. And I realize this is a major building that apparently nobody values enough to want to fix it other than Cass. And I guess that's the major problem, but I think, in the long run, this project is, is going to be sad for Wayne. I truly do. And I think that when we show an, a, a plan like this that they have here, this doesn't even show where the parking, I mean, there's going to be a big gaping hole right next to the mansion where these cars go in and out and a fence above it. And I'm, an, or I'm someone who loves and knows a lot about landscaping. And this grass thing that they put on the top here, Susan and I have been watering the plants that are growing in ground next to the mansion. If we don't water them every week, they die. So when you have only 12 inches on there, unless somebody's out there watering this grass all the time, it's going to die. So you're going to have this, this parking lot, this parking garage is not going to be all underground. And, and it's deceptive to say that, in my opinion, unless I am totally wrong here. And, so we're going to have this big, when you look up at the mansion, you're going to see this thing, not these little round trees that they're showing here. You're going to see the stalks of the things and this big gaping hole and probably something that is going to die on the top of it. It's taking up the whole yard. That's taking up the whole yard. And this is the, I mean, I'm, I like Cass and Joan a lot. I just don't, I, I, it makes me cry to think what is happening to the mansion. And I, I just had to get up and say that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Last call for public comment. I'm going to turn to Peter for a second to remind us exactly what the next step is. Um, it's just a, this is just a recommendation to the Zoning Hearing Board. Um, I believe uh, you, you, you know, any comments you want to pass on to the Zoning Hearing Board, it's actually not a recommendation, it's comments. 
uh, that you, you pass on, if any. You don't have to pass any on. You can pass a list on. You can just send your, the minutes of this meeting on. Um, but it, it's just a preliminary review. I, I think you guys have done uh, beyond the call of duty on this particular project. It is going to come back to you for subdivision and land development. Um, but here at this time, it's just comments to the Zoning Hearing Board for them to take into consideration when they review uh, this application. So just passing on our minutes is, is more that, than that would adequate. Yeah, okay. unless there's something you want to wish okay. to emphasize. Does anybody feel we need to do more than that at this point in time? I have a question. Will they get it this week? You are so good. <laughs> but they'll be emailed out to the board, the zoning board tomorrow. Right. Because their meeting, I believe, is this Thursday, right? Yeah. Okay, great. You stay all night and do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so with that, everyone's okay with just give me a show of hands to just send our comments on. Any opposed to doing that? We that's what we will do. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody. Kathy uh, Tennant. All right, great. Uh, our final application for this evening is SD 2005-D22R, a final revised plan for previously approved land development for three retail units in an 18,000-square-foot building to six units in an 18,000-square-foot building to include three-four restaurants at 200 North Chester Road. The applicant is Brandywine Realty Trust. The applicant present. Thanks, Nick. I'll just give you a second to clear the room and switch papers around, and we will begin. Go right ahead, right. sir. Uh, Nicholas Keneally representing Brandy Wine on this matter. Uh, this was a development that was approved by the board uh, back in 2006. Uh, the TD Bank building is here, and it was a, a two-stage development. And what the board approved back in 2006 was the whole development, but they requested that when Brandy Wine build out this pad that they come back uh, to the Planning Commission, which is why we're here this evening. Uh, basically, the plan is very similar to what uh, was previously approved by the uh, Board of Commissioners and by the Planning Commission. There are some minor changes that I'll ask the engineer to come up and perhaps discuss real briefly, and then we'll have a brief presentation by the architect. Um, also, we've reviewed the letter from the township engineer, and we have no problem with any of the comments. Great. Thank you. See if this plan shows. Uh, it's difficult because it's red on there. It's not picking up. Hi, my name is Matt Chartrand. I'm from uh, Bowler Engineering. Uh, we prepared the plan that was originally uh, brought before the township back in 2005, 2006 time frame, uh, and we've also been involved in the update uh, to this plan. Really, in terms of the development itself. Uh, as Nick mentioned, it is virtually the same as what we had previously proposed, 18,000 18, square foot building. Uh, at that point, was just called out as retail at the time that we were in here. We didn't really know, you know what may or may not be in that building. I think there's been a little bit further definition of that as to you know, how that would be uh, defined between retail and restaurant uses. But really, the only fundamental changes that we made to this plan is directly around uh, use the pointer here, but directly around the building itself, and that's just really where this, this sidewalk itself falls uh, relative to the building. We pulled it up along that frontage there. Again, this may be um, 
you know, four or five or six different storefronts that we're going to have along that portion. So the need to have some flexibility to where those doors are along the um, Radnor Chester Road frontage. And then on the two sides of the building, we have expanded into a uh, more of a uh, concrete patio type area that's, that would be there uh, for potential use in, um, you know, outdoor dining or some seating in the, those areas. But right now, the way we have it is just to have the uh, the concrete up around the front and the back of the building. And then what we also did was added some uh, connections via sidewalk to the rear parking lot behind us, which is hopefully, as you know, uh, with this site is the office use that's behind there. So with the thought being that, you know, after hours, that there's going to be you know extensive parking that's available back in those areas that there could be some um, cross access through those areas so we wanted to provide for those pedestrian connections in terms of the plan that's that's really it for what we've done um, overall we did take out three parking spaces along the side of the building here where we have that uh, that concrete area but other than that it's it's in effect the same yeah, and I think also, Matt, that since the stormwater management ordinances have changed, we actually have had to go back and actually provide uh, more management. Is that right? Sure. Well, what, what we've actually done here is, uh, is taken another look at this. The area that we have up towards the front of the site, and again, when, when we were looking at the phase two development, since we didn't really know at that time what was going to go there, we did you know, uh, size that and look at stormwater management at the time that we developed the plan before, but now we're looking at it, obviously, you know, knowing what, what's going to be there. We now have kind of a large, low, flat, uh, above ground rain garden area that we're proposing up towards the front of the site, which is already in a, a buffer space that's there of, uh, I think it's approximately 100 feet back from the edge of the curb line to that area. So you know, we're utilizing that green area that we already have and trying to uh, utilize that for our stormwater management. Okay. Patrick? Sorry, we uh, tested this just uh, earlier this evening, so hopefully we'll get it fixed. Sure. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Patrick McGranigan. I'm with Granham AI, architect for the project. It's, um, here we go. It's a, a pretty simple building we have to present to you tonight, and we'll be presenting it to the design review uh, committee tomorrow, uh, along with uh, samples of the materials and you know, in more detail about the way in which the building was designed, but I'd like to give you a brief overview tonight and be happy to answer any questions you have. So it's obviously a one-story building. It's uh, positioned on the site, uh, coplanar with the front of the TE Bank building, um, so it's a good setback from the street. It's roughly 180 feet in length and 100 feet in depth. Um, as you can imagine, with this um, site's orientation, the principal views would be to the south and to the west as it relates to the public experience of this building. From the east, uh, the view from Radnor Chester Road, uh, the east end of the building is somewhat obscured by the adjacent property and also some mature trees that are on the east side of the building. Uh, but however, on this, on this site, given that Brandywine is the owner of the whole complex, certainly the consideration of the back of the building, its, its uh, aesthetics, its character, and its relationship to large parking uh, at the back of the building, the north side of the structure is, is um, a, certainly a, a significant concern as well. But given the proximity to uh, Radnor Chester Road, as you can imagine, we have quite a lot of glass along the front of the building, so a storefront system along the south side. Uh, we have broken it up at times to give it a bit of, of character at the end of the building with a, another material that's a simulated stone product uh, that provides a series of piers and, uh, and turns the corner. Uh, the material above that you see, this reddish tone, is um, it's quite an interesting material that's actually originally designed as a roofing product. It's a terracotta shingle 
and it's designed as a in in this way for a wall application. So it has a nice texture, uh, and uh, you know it's I think it'll give a lot of character to the building and and still be quite compatible with the structures that are adjacent. Uh, as Matt pointed out, we have uh, we have um, the, uh, suggested the possibility of exterior dining on the west side of the building, with two tenants potentially opening up on that side. Uh, tenant negotiations uh, and leasing for the building is ongoing, so we're giving you really a status report. And there's also, as you can see in the site plan, an idea of having some outdoor space at the east end, the southeast corner of the building as well. The storefront turns the corner from the south onto the west wall, and there's a, a suggestion in the drawing, as you can see, of a fixed canopy above the outdoor dining. And that's really part of a discussion that's ongoing with potential tenants at this end of the building. And at the rear of the building, uh, we have the service entrances for the retail tenants. And we've, we've taken the, it's, you know, it's, it's not a very good rendition of the color of the material, but we've taken a uh, metal component that actually forms screening of the mechanical units at the rooftop of the building beyond the facade at the back of the building a couple of feet. Uh, and by doing so, we, we provide a bit of architectural character uh, and some more, more interesting uh, volumetric characteristics of the building. It also provides cover for the doors and a way to provide lighting uh, along that edge so it's well lit and, and uh, can be maintained quite well. And then the east end of the building, um, I should say that the material at the back of the building below that is um, brick. And the brick turns the corner and then interacts with the stone material that I mentioned that is originating at the southeast corner of the building. Uh, and then a, a roof element that provides a bit more of architectural character at the roof line, sort of a modern age cornice in a way. In terms of signage, we'd like to provide a, you know, an integrated solution uh, with the building, so it's something that's managed and, and provided as a system, uh, which can be worked with um, to accommodate tenant needs over time. So there's a signage band that interrupts the terracotta shingle on the front, and it's a place for uh, for tenants to provide uh, their own signage, their logo, that would be done in a way that would comply with township requirements and be something that from an owner standpoint would be manageable and, and sort of predetermined ahead of time, scale, uh, and, and the, you know, to some extent the characteristics of, of the signage, although there'll be modifications based on, on the logos of each tenant. So entrances of the building principally on the south side, uh, a couple of entrances on the west and on the east side as well that initially is thought to serve the adjacent exterior dining space and in the future it's, you know, it's, it could potentially serve a, as a tenant entrance on that side of the building if, if there's a reconfiguration in the future. It's not planned to be a, an entrance today. Okay. Now with that, I'd, I think we'd like to answer any questions you may have about the proposal. I'll start. How do you, now with potentially six tenants, how do you handle trash and deliveries? Well, the, the deliveries, and, and Matt, um, feel free to jump in as well, but I can show you on this plan, and we can refer back to the site plan, but basically the deliveries come into the site. Uh, uh, actually, the, the entrance, and Matt, maybe, maybe I should sure. turn to you. And The, uh, the deliveries for this site, and again, this is how it, it was previously proposed as well, but the deliveries for the site would come in. Hang through, on, Matt. They don't, they don't, oh, they don't have that up there yet. If you want to switch, that's I'll fine. I'll translate it. That's fine. They, they would come in from the main driveway uh, at Radnor Chester Road, which is a signalized intersection. Um, I can hold this plan At this plan, it's basically here. More. Basically, it's, it's at this yeah. point. Okay. Yeah, I'll use... I guess pointing to yeah okay so just over towards the the rear portion of the site uh, that you have here there's that's where the trash enclosures are the the far northeast corner of the site and in fact what we've done is is expanded that area slightly from from just having two enclosures there it's now even wider uh, to accommodate for compactors it's uh, approximately about 40 feet wide back in that area and what we've done is taken the curb line, if you can see my mouse cursor here, uh, that curb line extended it straight up to that point. So deliveries that would come in would come across the front of the site around park in this 
area here, which is a, a loading area, and then there is a, a walkway that transitions to the back of the building that you have there. So the loading would be in a fixed location away from the back. That's why we're able to have parking uh, right up against the back side of the building. Yeah, and then they would, would circulate the, to the back side of the site and back out to the, uh, to the light when they leave. Yeah, so turning the model, here's the uh, compactors at this edge and then the walkway that Matt mentioned along the back of the building, uh, the service entrances at the back. How many vehicles can you accommodate at once? And what size? The, the space itself, the overall... Loading. The loading area. The loading area itself is uh, about 110 feet long. So you, know, you could put back to back really two uh, WB 50, you know, 50 foot trailers that were in there. That, that wouldn't be the anticipation that there would be, you know, loading at the same time. But there's sufficient room in that area to be able to accommodate that you would, you know, be able to have. Maybe you have one uh, longer trailer truck that's making a delivery, and you still have sufficient room for a panel truck, or you know FedEx or somebody else that, that may come in and some other delivery vehicle. There would still be sufficient room for them there. Um, <clears throat> Nick, what was the reason that, when the original plan went through in 2005, that you had to come back? for final plan approval for the second phase? It was just part of the condition of the original plan approval that since it was a fa two-phase development, uh, they asked us to come back for the second phase to basically, if, if I recall correctly, Tony was involved in that. I wasn't, but uh, my understanding was since we hadn't determined what actually is going on that pad, uh, the Planning Commission wants to come back and give you more of an update as to when it was developed, what would be going there. Okay, and so um, the looking at one of the comments about parking, um, the the parking calculation is indicating that there's 193 parking spaces required based on the proposed building area. Is it three the, restaurants? Is it four? Yeah, I mean, see, that's, that's going to change yeah, the based, parking. Yeah, what? No, it's what, based by the seats. Yes, yeah, based on the number of seats, and what they estimated, I believe, was so many seats per for the entire site, and I'm and uh, yeah, 357 seats is what they were saying. 320 indoor, 37 outdoor. So they were calculating if there was outdoor seating in the parking requirement itself. Now, of course, what happens there if it turns out being retail, they still have to comply. It's just the formula that they would have. Retail generally requires less than restaurant use because restaurants based on the number of seats. So uh, they would still have to when the uses are going in. It would have to be basically a downgrade calculation as to whether it complies with the parking or not. So we have X amount of seats, and then we have to back into those X amount of seats. That's or X amount of spaces, and we have to back into the X, those spaces. So you, in, in our recommendation, you realize that you'll be limiting yourself to the number of overall dining seats, yes. regardless of the number of units within this that would be restaurant versus not. Right. OK. Um, and the, uh, I drove by there today, I tried to orient myself a little bit. This property ends, this is the area with that broken up piece of parking lot, right? And there's a driveway that is north of it. Yeah, we're not, that driveway That's not your property. No, it is. It is, but that's being closed. We're not using that. Okay. It would be this entrance and then the entrance controlled by the, the existing the, entrances will right. be Right, and then there's, I think it's Mainline Health that's next to you, and then it's that's the road. Uh, up the hill. Yeah. Okay. So then the only other question I had had to do with um, 25527 I2, uh, which had to do with that the minimum, uh, the minimum of 200 feet between points of access, the, that existing entry that looks like it's kind of one way in coming south down Radnor Chester. Is that, I can't tell on my map, is that 200 feet from the signal at the TD Bank? Yeah, it is. As a matter of fact, if you look, you know, from center line, center line of where that driveway intersects out to Radnor, Radnor Chester Road, the right-in driveway that you're referring to, out to the center line of 
the uh, signal lines there intersects about 320 feet. Okay, good. Between those. So, and, and again, as mentioned before, we're not proposing any other access along Radnor Chester Road. That's going to be it, just that right in driveway. Okay, and all of the, um, well, I saw the parking calculations. There's no more than 10 in a row, right? Are you guys asking for any waivers? Remember, this was a plan that was previously approved. Right. And no, so no changes in no terms changes. of waivers with yeah. the yeah. amended No plan. changes at all with anything that we're proposing between what was previously approved and what's being proposed here. Now, the, the only item I would note about the parking, uh, the 193 spaces versus uh, the 185 that were shown on there, there was a suggestion about potentially you know, holding those in reserve. Um, and I think that that's something that we would be interested in doing. We could, we do physically have the space on the plan to add the eight spaces. What we would like to do is put that behind where the existing TD bank is uh, in the landscape area. But again, some of those parking calculations are based on employee counts that we don't necessarily know. I think we've been pretty conservative in the estimates that we've put in there. But you know, if the employee count comes down, then we don't need those parking spaces. Um, you know, the, the total number of parking spaces that we have. So that would, I think, be our request mm -hmm. that we reserve those additional eight spaces. And you know, at such time that that uh, once this is developed or once you know those uses shake out a little bit more, then we understand whether or not we need to put them in. Yeah. And additionally, too, Brandywine owns the property of the rear and everything surrounding it. There's going to be cross easements. Although we do understand the parking requirement is basically on-site parking. So even if, even though we have additional parking off-site, we can't calculate that into our parking requirement numbers. And these calculations today for the existing, the required, the existing, and the provided, the uh, the nonconformity with regard to impervious coverage. Am I reading that? Right, yeah. There was an existing nonconformity, I believe, as to impervious coverage, and that was reduced when this plan uh, was first presented to the board, and that's not being increased by anything. Um, if you don't end up needing the parking spaces, will you keep, w and, and if you didn't develop them, would that bring, is this existing, uh, yeah, is this conformant, this uh, nonconformity, presuming the 193 spaces or the 185? The, the, the nonconformity that existed was relative to 63.6% impervious. That was at the time that you know, we developed this plan uh, back in 2005, 2006 for what was on site. And that, that's been maintained throughout this. So that was, that's the existing nonconformity. If we added the additional eight spaces, we still would not come above that 63.6% you know, of what was determined to be the nonconformity. 55% is what's allowable in this particular district. So we still have that little bit of wiggle room to, to play with. If we need to add those spaces in, we would not then further need zoning relief, which is, I think, the question that you're asking. My question is the 62.29 is 185 spaces. Correct. And adding the eight additional spaces, if it We're turns out you need them, won't put you above the 63.6? The 63 no, it won't. Uh, if you look at the because we're, we're dealing with such a large area here of about five acres of property, we have you know, 133,000 square feet in the existing um, condition and then down to 130, so 130, 275. So we have about 3,000 square feet that we could play with there and still not exceed that original, that original number is okay. what I'm getting at. Thank you. Sure. I think I brought this up back in 06. I guess the one concern I continue to have is the proximity of the building to the high school and controlling the tenant mix that goes into it. It's great if it's going to be a Starbucks and a coffee shop and a bagel shop. It'll be a horror story if it becomes a Hooters. How do we control that? <laughs> Funny, but you know, oh. Nick's kids have graduated high school. Mine just started. So. <laughs> We own several million square feet in the township. Obviously, we don't want our tenants in, uh, uh, being jeopardized uh, in, in the nature of, of the type of restaurants you're talking about. The whole, the whole thing here was, was to provide services for not only our tenant base, but for the residents as well. So, I mean, we're looking at a quality um, uh, restaurant groups that, are, that we're being very picky about. And um, I'll be very honest with you, the rents are not low. They're high. Um, and that's a tribute to Radnor because Radnor can can uh, qualify for that. And uh, it's important for us that we maintain that level 
of what we've done here in the township since we bought these properties in 2004. And I think you've all seen all the improvements that we've made to them. So I think it's just a testament that now we have this vacant piece of land which once housed the old PennDOT building. And I, I think it's probably reached its point of now's the time to do something with it. So, yeah, I agree with you on that one. It's not goes back to the question, you know, can we somehow limit how many liquor licenses go into the site? Uh, we talked I, about I don't, this I don't know whether we there. can, can um, yeah, we wouldn't want to see a legal question. I can't answer yeah. that. I would not like to, uh, to deal, deal with that question, to be perfectly frank. Um, uh, you know, we have two successful restaurants within the 555 building on site. Um, they both have restaurants. I don't believe there's been any issues there in the five years that they've been operational. Um, and we don't really suspect that we would, when well, we wouldn't want issues that, that would be a detriment to our office population. I mean, you know, we, thousands of people are employed in these buildings and we certainly want, want, want to provide a, uh, a safe working environment at the same time, providing them with services so they're going to have a dinner and a meal and a glass of wine if they so choose. So. Well, Thank you. Speaking of the kids at the high school, which brought up my other uh, thought about this is, um, can you keep them off our property? The, <laughs> the, the proximity of the building to the, to the high school might encourage the kids to come on over uh, for lunch or what have you, which that's great if it's a good establishment. But uh, it's a pretty dangerous road right now as it currently exists. And you know now we're proposing putting in a lot more parking, more traffic on the road, um, I, I know you're certainly not required to do this, but if, um, you know, would you consider something that might help with the, with the traffic on that road? Uh, I don't know what you're referring to. We can't put another traffic light out there, obviously, but, uh, cause PennDOT would never approve it. But the, uh, I mean, if, if a crosswalk across the road there from, and I don't know where you'd put it, there's that exit where the senior shack is, I guess you call it. Um, maybe in that vicinity, because the, the sidewalk does currently exist along the entire length of, uh, of Radnor Chester Road, both sides. So they could, they, could, they could walk safely to the traffic light and cross over if, if that was the case. And I don't know whether, I don't know what regulates a crosswalk. Yeah, yeah, you know they're not going to do that, you know, walk the traffic light. But, yeah, it, crosswalk probably wouldn't be a bad idea there. I just don't know, you know, again... That is a township road. I don't think it's a state road. Um, it's state. Is a state? It's a state uh, road. So again, I, 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 Nick, what were the, the waivers that are on the bottom of the plan? I had asked you about waivers earlier. Oh, is there something on there? There's five of them. Were they from the first phase? Oh, uh, they must have been. Yes, I wasn't even aware. Huh? I'm sorry, Susan. Okay, so that's not. They were from, yeah, that's not from. Yeah, that's not from this one. Okay. And and to answer your question. Um, I'm open to any ideas that make it a little safer along that road. Well, you, you do know but currently we have a, and as much as we try to police it, the existing parking lot, not that lot, they don't park on this, the old remaining parking lot that's there. They go to the nice parking behind it as part of the office building. And we have a substantial number of students that kind of piggyback over there on a daily basis. As much as we try to patrol it, and we do have our, our security force that's there all day long, that moves and roams throughout the site even into the evening, we can't control it. It's, it's really a, a difficult situation. So Teddy and I uh, have had arguments. Over yeah. So. <laughs> I say, I'm let the damn kids ride life. the bus, but nobody wants to listen to me. <laughs> I wish I, I had busing when I was in high school. The driveway that's being abandoned that's currently potted. Yes. Closed. Well, those pots move on, on depending upon what's going on at the high school. Right. <laughs> my, my question is, you're going to continue to leave that there we, when we talk back in No, no, six, no, that gets closed. There was an closed opportunity. Closed permanently and grassed over, or? Uh, yeah, it will be, it will, the, the curb cut goes away. The, uh, um, uh, the, the curb goes back in at full height. The sidewalk goes across there, and it's closed off. Okay. Yeah, yeah so. grass. Yeah, I, I don't know whether it's very clear on that plan, but no, the reason why it was left on there, there were originally two entrances off of Reiner Chester Road with the, with the PennDOT building. When the bank went through, and Matt can speak to this much more clearly than I, I can, there was, there was the concern that we weren't going to get both of them. 
So the question was always open that the, the sweep, the right hand in sweep, could be eliminated and you could go with a, with a new entrance at the right. other end. We've chosen the sweep works right now. Why, why mess with something if it already works? And from a traffic standpoint, it's safer because I don't have opposing traffic trying to make a left into there as well. So you talk about traffic conditions and, and movement of traffic Helps. through there, it's better to utilize the light and, to, and, and the, the right hand sweeps. And now that gets closed. Any other questions? Any public comment? Hi, I'm Patty Booker. I'm the president of the Radnor School Board. And I'm here this evening to um, just chat with you a little bit about the concerns of the high school being the immediate neighbor to this property. I also happen to be a neighbor myself. I live on Bell Rose. And I use King of Prussia Road and down on to Radnor Chester Road. It's my main access out to the community. So I have not only the school district's interest, but my own as well, and those of my neighbors. Um, with, and I respect the fact that this is kind of a redo on a, on a, or at least just bringing forward a, a plan that you had approved prior. But since that approval, the mainline health facility has opened. There is a parking lot. It's roughly 25, 30 feet offset from the Raider Road that enters into the high school. Right now, the, and actually for as long as I can remember, so for at least 13 years, if not longer, the school district and the township have uh, worked together to provide a police officer at the beginning and the end of the school day to help get kids safely in and out of that property. You're talking about huge, massive you know, quantity of traffic, not just kids, but you have all the staff. Then you also have all the parents that are dropping kids off and picking them up through the day. You also have all the sports activities that happened at the end of the day. And when there's not a police officer there is even the greater concern for me as a resident and as a member of the school board. We're also talking about a consolidated number of new drivers. These kids don't really have the skills that maybe those of us with 40 years of experience have in terms of making a decision of when to pull out off of Raider Road and make that left-hand turn onto Radnor Chester. So I would like to ask that we consider as part of this plan, especially with the fact if we're introducing three or four restaurants in there, the number of companies or um, cars going in and out of that facility is going to be significantly increased. We're already having a problem associated with the mainline health directly across the driveway, even with the police officer there causes a problem. Can't make, he stops traffic, everybody stops in front of that driveway, can't make a left-hand turn till the next person moves forward. It becomes a problem managing the kids. Um, the other big concern that I have, and Susan, you brought it up and I sincerely appreciate it, and that is the fact of the kids walking across the street. They should not be parking in your parking lot. We have tried everything in our, in our ability to make them not do that. We even said, oh, maybe if we don't have a police officer there, that would you know, keep them from trying to cross the street and park in your parking lot. We'll continue to work that effort. Um, but you know, the degree of control we have on that. But you talked about the idea of put, excuse me, putting a Hooters in. I'm more concerned about the Starbucks. Because the Starbucks is what's going to attract these kids to cross that street hundreds of times a day. Um, so I recognize and appreciate the, you know, the, the building and the space and what you're going to do with it, and it certainly has got to be better than what currently is there. But I think we cannot underestimate the impact of the traffic that having a space like that is going to have on that road. And I'd like us to take that in consideration now before we make any other additional changes. I'd like to also um, bring up, I guess, before Dan Malloy left, um, you know, I, I actually, I've been sitting in traffic meetings on the behalf of the Radnor Library, if you would believe it, but a lot of conversations about putting a traffic light at this location or at the other entrance to the high school. And really, the reason that it's not been a function of, of Pennsylvania PennDOT saying we can't do it, it's been a function of the money, quite frankly. Um, my recollection is it's over $250,000 for the light. Um, and we have not had them say, no, you positively can't do it. We just haven't gotten that far because nobody wanted to pay for it. So given the fact that Mainline Health was finished, now the TD Bank is there, a couple of projects that aren't that old, 
um, Dan Malloy had made some mention some time back before he left that perhaps there's some dollars in an escrow account or in escrow accounts on those previous projects that might be able to be used, you know, in addition with the school district or perhaps with this property um, to put a traffic light at that corner of Raider Road because the kids are not going to walk down to the traffic light and then walk back up past the TD Bank. It's just not going to happen. And the weekends is the other concern that I have. The property is heavily, heavily used on the weekends with people who don't really know the traffic pattern, which is even worse. You got these parents coming in with little kids. They don't know what it's about. And it's double parked and backed up. And it, it's, it's a mess. So I would like to ask that you consider putting a traffic light as part of this package. Thank you. And I think that was it. Yeah, just a couple. Um, Go ahead. One, uh, again, I'm not certain the warrants on a traffic light, and I believe there has to be a certain distance between traffic lights, so that's something that, again, it's going to be a PennDOT issue. Um, secondly, as to traffic, remember this is a retail restaurant use. The traffic that Patty's talking about, I'm very familiar with, is 7.30 in the morning, trying to get in that parking lot. The mainline health building, obviously, there are office workers that are coming in at 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. With restaurant retail type use, we're talking 10 o'clock type earliest 10 o'clock um, and then obviously for the restaurant use you're talking more about uh, afternoons and then uh, evenings for dinner so I don't think it coincides with the traffic that the high school is concerned about it's more the office type use that that, that they would be concerned about and again on the traffic light I you know the engineers would be better able to, than me to say what warrants a traffic light within uh, so many feet of another traffic light I guess if I could just add, um, looking at the conditions of, of uh, final plan approval from five years ago, uh, this issue actually was addressed and the applicant um, had agreed, I guess, to contribute, I guess, one third of the cost of a traffic signal. Uh, but I guess uh, that's based on the township, I guess, doing the design or, and, and the warrants. So I'm not sure where we stand on the warrants or anything, but it was, it was a condition of approval that they would contribute, I guess, up to one third of the cost of the signal. Are, are you, um, in terms of the restaurants that are going to be in there, are you limiting what types of restaurants? I mean, if it's a, if it's a place like Starbucks that opens at 7 o'clock in the morning or whatever time they open, or is that not a possibility? Is it truly going to be more of a lunch dinner? Or you're not, you don't want to limit yourself to that, right? No, you, you, actually, you're, you're correct. Your last statement's correct. You don't want to. But you also don't want to duplicate uses in there as well. Because if you put two of the same uses in there, you only contradicting one of them. One of them's going to fail somewhere along the line. So then you're putting more money into it. Well, so the, the ones, and we haven't signed any yet, so I'm not at liberty to say to you that's going to be an X, Y, and Z. But we're looking at a combination. Some will do lunch. Some will do lunch and dinner. I should say some do lunch. Some will do. There's only one so far that talks about a breakfast trade. Mm -hmm. There is really no location in this area, Radnor, where you can go for breakfast other than the hotel at the corner. Um, but something more of a breakfast trade, and it, and, and it is not Starbucks. So I can tell you that. <laughs> um, well, the kids will be upset. I'm yeah, sorry. I'm sure they will be. But um, uh, the other three are, are, are primarily lunch and dinner. They, they don't do a breakfast trade. Okay. So, um, and, and we're talking, and these aren't large restaurants. I mean, if you go to Susanna Fu or Fleming's, they're eight, 9,000 square feet apiece. Uh, we're talking 3,000 square foot restaurants. And then and, and in size, by the time you take the kitchen and the storage and everything out, you're not talking large scale uh, establishments. There's a possibility that somebody may take two pieces of it, like 6,000 square feet or 7,000 square feet, but that just decreases the number, total number of restaurants down the line. And we recognize that if we did all, the maximum number of restaurants we could do is four because of the way we've allocated the seating through the parking restriction. Sure. So, you know, and we can't use our adjacent parking because it's not on the same lot. Okay. I mean, so that might speak or help to the traffic issue in the morning, but it's not going to help with the pedestrian in the, afternoon, in the afternoon. The kids, we have open campus. I don't know if you're I aware that. of that. So the kids can come and go throughout the day as they like, and they do already. They walk over to Gennardi's, et cetera. So we are definitely I, dealing with that. We, we see the kids all the time I'm because they're going through our parking yeah, lot. Sorry. <laughs> Walking and or driving. It's, it's a fact of life. Uh, they like the shortcut through the turn at, um, at 
not the light at Gennardi's because that one you can't make a left into our parking lot, but the, the next light down there, they love that cut through. Uh, and they also love the uh, ability to really go pretty fast through the parking lot. So we're, we're, you know, we constantly have to patrol our own property because we're concerned about their safety as well as the safety of the people parking. So. Um, and uh, this is not an aspersion on the school board or anything else. I don't, I, I, I it's just realities and we know it, so. Um, we yeah. yeah, and just, I was just gonna add that David's right, I just was looking at number 13 and that, that, uh, that condition does carry on. So it's not like you even have to add it. Uh, the applicant, it appears at that time, did agree that they would contribute a minimum of one third of the cost of a single traffic light along Brown or Chester Road if it was necessary. Uh, and I really believe that was the bank's condition. Oh, okay. Well, because this had to come back anyhow, so. Right. Uh, but that's something we'd have to deal with with, uh, well, no, obviously not commerce, but with TD, I guess, at this point in time. Um, other than that, I, I don't have anything else Good. to add. Thank you. Any other public comment? Any other discussion? If no discussion, a motion to approve oh. or deny? Boy, you moved fast. Hang on. That's so okay. Go ahead. what about this issue about the ESCO for the light then? It's there. It's great. We're so. But this goes One to third. final. Oh, it said at least a third. I, did I just re hear that correctly? What at least a third? It says David or contribute a minimum of, of one third. Minimum. A minimum. Right. Okay. Good. That that's not an escrow, that's a it says contribute and the reason I believe is probably in there is again because of the warrants. I don't know if the warrants will justify constructing a light. I don't know if it was ever looked into. I doubt if it, if it really was. So it's there. I don't you know. Now, would Mainline Health be part of that also? Would they contribute? I don't some? think. I don't think they. Unless, there is any. unless you put a restriction on that approval that went on when they re renovated that building. I mean, you had. A, they didn't have to come and, here and for the that garage thing. that they built. They didn't. And everything else, so. okay. Yeah, they didn't have to come to. Uh, well, yeah. When did that plan well, they had get to approved? Get the garage approved, didn't they? Mainline Health. It, yeah. yeah, we didn't see. Structure, remember. Well, the, oh, right. the garage went to zoning, but I don't recall right. yeah, it anything. Didn't come here because uh, existing building. I don't think Mainline Health came to the planning board. It was a reuse of existing yeah. building. They did not. Yeah, it was a yeah, they did not. Thanks, Nick. So it's a minimum of one third. Thank you, David and Nick. I'll make a motion that we approve this. But I, I you know, but I, I, and I'm sure Mrs. Booker is going to stay right on top of this issue of a traffic light. So, which is great to hear because I think the street needs it. So, but I'll make a motion that we uh, recommend approval of this final plan. Second. Um, Hang on one second before the second. Was that a second or discussion? That was going to be a second, yeah. yeah. I have a first and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any old business? Any new business? Should we add the green roof zoning to the new business to relook at the? Yes. I guess we at least to make the note to the commissioners that mm -hmm. we'd like to Like review. sooner rather than later because they're coming you. in and it, it's kind of a crapshoot, really. Right. You got that, Sue? Motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you. Meetings adjourned.